Jay, I got a toy truck for Christmas. What did you get? Bronchitis. Half in the bag. Oh, hi. Oh, I didn't see you there. Welcome to the official 33rd annual <laughs> Half in the Bag recap video. And we're gonna recap films from 2017. Um, this is not a top 10 list. No, this fuck is, that shit. This is not the best of 2017. It's not the worst of. It's just films that we saw, we ha have mostly liked or some we disliked. But just the ones that we haven't talked about on Half in the Bag. Ones we haven't talked about on Half in the Bag and that we would like to talk to you about today. I'm Mike. <laughs> and I'm Jay. Some of these will be movies that we've both seen. Some will be ones that you've seen and I haven't and vice versa. We've both put together lists. Let's start off with our first film. I guess chronologically that we didn't do a half in the bag on. And that film is Split. This will be the only film to be in any sort of chronological order. Yeah. I've never seen a case like this before. 23 identities live in Kevin's body. Split was James McAvoy as a person with multiple personality disorder. Was anyone upset about that? I was just about to say, Jay, I wrongly predicted uh, pick picketing and, and protest uh, mental illness shaming. Because we were talking about that with his last movie, too, The Visit, about the, the elderly people uh, that escape from the mental institute. Yes. They're like, are people going to be upset about him making a movie about crazy people? Right, right. And I guess everyone's still okay with crazy people. Yeah. So that's good. Crazy people can't figure out how to get to the theater to protest. <laughs> and people that work uh, in, the, in the healthcare industry with people with mental illness, they just have too much shit to do. <laughs> they don't go see stupid M. Night Shyamalan movies. I think literally though, that might be the, the answer. Okay, that but, works. But uh, uh, I liked Split. Uh, it was the first M. Night Shyamalan movie I've seen in 25 years that I liked. I was, I was split on The Visit. Oddly enough, there are things about that movie that I liked. Oh yeah, that was a hackneyed um, piece of garbage. <laughs> but it was entertaining. It was entertaining. I think I think our confusion on it was how much of it was intentionally funny. Right. Um, in this movie, there's a fair amount that's funny, and it's clearly intentional. Uh, what I liked about this movie, I liked about the visit, and I liked even more so about this one, is that M Night Shyamalan has given up the facade of being like snooty, pretentious artist man, and he's just making schlock really well-crafted, entertaining schlock, which is what this is. Well, there's a clandestine meeting at, at like a coffee shop where, where Jason Blum slipped him a gigantic check. Oh, okay. And said... He said, drop the act. He said, do you like being an artist or do you like money? <laughs> now, let's make a schlock film about psychopathic elderly people. <laughs> it's gonna bring in the kitties. <laughs> Well, it's weird because there's not, as far as the concept goes, there's not that much of a difference between this and some of the other like shit movies he's done over the years, like The Happening, like, oh no, Evil Plants. The Happening. Like, ha it, 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 it lacks that like that, that air that he's doing something serious. Oh, yeah. He's having fun with this movie. I, I would argue that The Happening had a like a hackneyed eco message. Well, to that it. that too. Yeah, you know? he's dropped all of yeah. that. All those notions and just made a really well-crafted thriller. Yeah. Uh, it, the premise is a little silly, and it reached a point in the movie where I was like, this is getting a little too ridiculous. But then it kept going to the point where I was like, oh, we're going that far. Now it's won me over again. An individual with multiple personalities can change their body chemistry with their thoughts. And of course, spoilers, the... the, the Everybody knows now. The payoff year later spoilers is what solidifies it into perfection for me because it's like if that movie just ended i'd be like uh, but then i'd be i was like why <laughs> are you talking I, about the uh, the bruce willis yeah character? yeah okay. yeah the the twist that it's takes place in the bruce willis superhero universe it's it's not so much of a twist like the classic m night twist no. so much as it is just like another revelation because the story's over at that point so yeah, like no. people people were like leaving the theater and then that scene came on and people were like what the fuck yeah is like he he made a backdoor uh sequel which is great yeah right it wasn't necessarily a twist as far as yeah like you said the story goes it was just it was just a what like you really did that yeah like, that's awesome you just don't see like crazy shit like that too much. Sure, well, and the fact that, because in this era of like cinematic universes and shared universes, like the idea that was kept completely silent mm -hmm. and like nobody knew about it, 
um, even into opening weekend, because I didn't see it like opening day or anything. I saw it a couple days later. I guess it's because people don't talk about M. Night Shyamalan anymore. But when I saw it, I, I hadn't heard a word about that. So it was a genuine surprise. And yeah. it's so rare to be surprised by movies anymore. What was interesting about it is that it was it was sort of meta because you expect a twist at the end of M. Night Shyamalan movie. And while it wasn't a conventional narrative twist, it was a twist on the M. Night Shyamalan twist. <laughs> so he found a way to surprise me. Yeah. Other than... Uh, making a terrible film. Well, that, that's, that was the biggest surprise, is that the movie wasn't terrible. Yeah. But James I, McAvoy, uh, fantastic. Um, the, the girl, who was the girl from the Vavitch, uh, she's back in this. She was really good. Everyone's really solid. Great. And that's really, it's those two. I know there's the two other girls that are there. They're, they're not great, their performances. Um, but the, the kind of power struggle between uh, her, the lead girl, and James McAvoy right. was really good. That's the good. focus of the That's film. That's the focus clearly, of the movie. But... And we get some, some sweet James McAvoy dance moves right. when he's in the body of a, of a small child. Yeah, and he, he shows that he has, he has quite the acting range. His, his, his Brooklyn accent is, is wonderful. <laughs> um, I, and that's a movie I think, I think we liked. And I, oh, I, yeah. caught it, I caught it on uh, TV recently, and I sat and watched a little, and I'm like, hey, that's good. Well, it, he keeps coming that. up with, because the whole movie, almost the whole movie is in one location. He goes out to visit the psychiatrist lady once in a while, but the bulk of it is just in this kind of underground facility. And he keeps coming up with new ways to shoot it. It doesn't, the, the setting doesn't get boring. He, he really knows how to use the camera in this in a way that he hasn't in a long time. His last few movies have been so, like, flat and ugly. So good job, M. Night. I'm sure your next movie will suck. Oh, so I think Jay, the next one is the gla the glass movie, the Samuel Jackson oh, character. See, yeah. A more conventional sequel to Unbreakable, I think. I don't need a sequel. I don't no. need anymore. I just need that. Le that leave it moment. well enough alone. No, this no, was yeah. a great little moment at the end where you're like, oh, we're in a superhero world. Good job. End it. Well, Jay, let's move on. Why don't you pick the next film? we talk about and if i've seen it i'll jump in if i haven't i will sit here and stare at you awkwardly <laughs> that sounds like a wonderful plan uh the next film i saw is skull island kong skull island i take by your silence you didn't see it is that a monkey I really liked Kong Skull Islands. I had no interest in seeing it. I didn't see it in the theater. I was like, fuck this. I was actually kind of turned off by, I had heard that they made Kong bigger, specifically so that he would be the appropriate size for when they eventually make the Godzilla versus King Kong movie. And that just felt so cynical and sleazy and gross. I was like, ah, fuck this movie. Um, but then I got curious when it was on video because I like Kong over the years in various movies. Uh, and I actually really liked it. it. Unlike the Godzilla reboots, the American Godzilla that came out a few years ago, which was like embarrassed to be making a Godzilla movie. There's was like, oh no, here comes Godzilla, uh, cut away. Oh, he's on the background of the TV. Aren't we clever? We're embarrassed to be making a Godzilla movie. Uh, this movie really just embraces making a big, silly, stupid monster movie with Kong fighting giant monsters on this island. Uh, I, I think it was when we talked about Spider-Man Homecoming and I talked about how I miss in these big movies the, the Sam Raimi weirdness where there's that like personal touch in a big blockbuster and this has a lot of that. It's not, it doesn't feel like a Sam Raimi movie but it just feels like this guy that likes video games and he likes, there's a, at one point in the movie there's a fucking Cannibal Holocaust reference which uh, caught me off guard. <sighs> All the characters are boring and disposable, which might be a breaking point for some people and completely understandable because like Brie Larson and Tom Hiddleston are the leads and their characters are flat and boring as fuck. Uh, John C. Riley's having a lot of fun. It almost seems like he just was doing his own thing and no one stopped him. But the devils live below us. I call them skull crawlers. Why? Because it sounds neat. Okay. Look, I just made that name up. I'm trying to scare you. Uh, so he's entertaining, but all the human characters kind of suck. Hmm. Um, which is a detriment to the movie. It's not a great movie, but I just enjoyed it 
for embracing the, the weird monster stuff. And there's lots of really uh, kind of slick camera work, lots of energy, lots of movement. I like the idea of, because I like a lot of Kong movies over the years, and this one kind of lacks that uh, uh, kind of lofty Peter Jackson, like, this is important. Like, I think I just had, like, I, I don't share the, the affinity with Kong. Like, I just don't care. <laughs> and I watched the Peter Jackson one. I think I saw it in the theater, and I was just bored to tears, <laughs> as most people were. I was like, it's over? They, they're leaving the island? What? We're two hours into the movie. They haven't even gotten to the fucking island yet. Oh god! But look at that! But look at that close-up of Naomi Watts as she puts her hand on the railing of the boat as she steps on the boat because this is important. Yeah. Just get to the goddamn island. So when I saw Kong, like bringing back Kong, it just had echoes of like, we're bringing back this, we're bringing back this, we're bringing back this, and here it comes. And I was like, no, no, no. And I heard it was good, and then I didn't watch it. Uh, I'd like to talk about a film that I think was a, a made for Amazon or Netflix film. It's called... See, this is one of the ones that left a big impression. I don't feel at home in this world anymore. That was made for Netflix. My house got robbed. What did they take? My grandma's silver. Did you call the authorities? Yeah. The world is bigger than your silverware. Grow up. It's a running theme this year, this last year. Um, some of the best movies I saw were made for Netflix because Netflix is willing to take chances. They'll make the big like Bright or uh, they'll release a full season of Fuller House because it's like that's safe and people want to see that type of shit. And then they also make these weird little small movies. Yes. Like I don't feel at home in this world anymore. Um, and apparently Bright is getting a sequel. Uh, the worst reviewed movie of the year is getting a sequel because it hit the numbers. Because a bunch of people watched it. Yes. Um, and so I don't know how many people watched I don't feel at home in this world anymore, but I appreciate that Netflix released it. So yeah, the, I think I think the model is changing because I the rent world a, is changing. The world is changing. I rent a lot of movies from the Redbox, and I watch a lot of streaming movies, as do you. Yes. Um, and more often than not, I'm starting to see that Amazon Studios logo come up, and then uh, Netflix and. And then I was like, I'm like, when someone comes and says, hey, I want to make this big movie, we're going to put it in the theaters? <laughs> no, that's where the comic book movies go, that's and that's it now. Yes, yeah. I think, I think my dreams may finally come true of a world without movie theaters. <laughs> and this is from a film buff. <laughs> if you have a nice home setup, you don't need to go to the fucking theater. That's right. And if you have the option... Like, uh, there are some movies, more independent movies, that will still get, they'll get a theatrical release, but the, some of them are starting to come out available for streaming, like, on the same day. There, there should be, like, a, like, a, like a, a, a movie theaters are going to turn into, like, like, exclusive private golf clubs, <laughs> where you have to have a membership to get in, and <laughs> you have to pass, like, a, like a background check, and... D Disney will get to work on this. They'll yeah. be in charge. Love will have a monopoly on all the theaters. You'll go in there, and it'll be like... Do do you do you want to eat an entire pizza while watching a film? <laughs> Check yes or, or no. Or are you okay with being in a theater with someone eating an entire pizza right next to your face? Right. Yeah. You have to you have to pass certain. Are you compelled to p piss in a bottle <laughs> and then roll it down down the aisle? You know. Do you shower regularly? You know things like that. And you have, you pa pass this questionnaire and you get like like a government issued card. That, <laughs> Will allow you into a movie theater, so you can see uh, X Men Twelve. Yeah, no, yeah. Let's get back to our <laughs> our, uh, our our topic at hand. I don't feel at home in this world anymore. A wonderful little film starring that lady, uh, Melanie Linsky. Who it was nice to see her in the lead because she was way way back. She was in Peter Jackson's movie uh, Heavenly Creatures. It was her and Kate Winslet. Hmm. They were the two stars of the movie, and it was a critically acclaimed movie. And one of them got super successful and famous, and the other one was Kate Winslet. 
Uh, <laughs> oh, I've seen this, this, the I don't feel at home in this world anymore girl in lots of random movies. She, yeah, she's movies. had a continued career, but obviously Kate Winslet's won Oscars and, you know, she's in all these prestige movies. And Melanie Liske, I think, was on uh, Two and a Half Men for a while. It's like, uh, and she's really great in this movie. And Elijah Wood is really good in it. People treat each other. Makes me so furious. Kevin, stop it. It's written and directed by Macon Blair, who has worked with uh, Jeremy Saunier, who directed Green Room and Blue Ruin. And so it has a little bit of that feel to it, that kind of like low-key, super violent crime. Dirty, dirty shower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but mixed with a little bit of the kind of Coen Brothers dark humor. Lots of dark um, humor. Which I liked. I, I loved Elijah Wood's character in this movie. Even if the film narratively or structurally doesn't have a perfect ending or payoff or isn't completely solid, it's it's that intensity and that like you just want to keep watching it yeah. kind of thing because this, the movie's about this like kind of humdrum boring girl who's kind of a nobody yeah and she meets up with elijah wood who is basically dwight schrute uh, yes um, <laughs> and, sort of delusional uh, yeah. mentality it's it's a, it's the the outcasts team up and, and try to take down the bad guys, more or less, but complications come along the way and become super violent and, and it's funny and, you know, I don't want to get into the whole plot. Yeah. We're not here to tell the plot. It's just one of those movies that where it, it's, a nice, it's a nice, refreshing, different kind of movie. I'm not letting you shoot anyone. Anyone, anyone else. Well, speaking of refreshing uh, and fun, I saw a violent, sad film called Raw. Raw is a French movie. Uh, it's a coming of age story about this girl that goes off to college. Uh, and and uh, it's sort of a, an allegory for kind of going off to college and discovering yourself and discovering your sexuality. Except instead of sexuality, she discovers that she likes eating people. It's cannibal film. It's coming of age cannibal film. Uh, it, it was sort of notorious, I guess. I, I want to say it was like the Toronto Film Festival or something. It got all this press for being like people were like passing out in the theater and like really upset by it. And so I kind of went into the movie with that mentality, like thinking this is going to be this really extreme. Because there was a, a while back, there was something called the French extreme horror movies, like high tension and stuff like that, where it's just like super gory. And this wasn't that at all. I don't know what the fuck. I'm assuming someone passing out was unrelated to the movie. I, I was just going to say, whenever you hear that story, then it's someone who has an unrelated medical condition. That's That has to be it. Because there's a off. little bit of violence in the movie, but it's 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 sparse. And when it happens, it's effective because it's used so sparingly. Um, but it's it's not like a comedy or anything. It's played completely straight, just as this sort of, this girl, she was raised uh, vegan by her family, and so she goes off to college, and as a hazing ritual, uh, she's forced to eat, I wanna say it's like raw rabbit meat or something. Okay. So she just has a bite of rabbit meat, and that sort of awakens in her this, this desire to eat meat. Um, and then it just escalates from there. So I, I really liked it. I, it's, the lead performance is really great. This, this girl kind of discovering herself. Um, uh, it is this really kind of just like sort of fluid camera work, very stylish, but not uh, calling attention to itself. So I liked it a lot. Well, speaking of coming of age, I'll just throw this one in here real quick. Uh, I recently watched a film called Brad's Status. Troy? You have 10 minutes. I just gotta put on my clothes. You got like the body of a man now. Hey, Dad, can you not be weird? Okay. Can you close my door? Yeah. I don't know what the fuck this is. Which I, which is a film I would, one, it had, it starred um, Ben Stiller. So that's a big no for me. <laughs> and the trailer made it look like it was some like cute, like I'm taking my kid to college and you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, and I don't know if this term's been coined before. Uh, coming of old age. <laughs> Because that's what this really was. It was this, uh, and this this will tie into our next film, okay, um, as well. Because uh, uh, Ben Stiller plays a man who's forty-seven years old, 
and his 16, 17 year old son is going off to look at colleges and him and his son take a trip. And, and Ben Stiller has a group of like three or four friends that were all friends in college. And all of them have gone on to be like ultra successful. One's like a hedge fund manager. One is like a political guy who's always on TV and wrote this really successful book. Um, the, one of the guys, um, him and his, his, his boyfriend, who's soon to be husband because they get married in the film, um, that's the director of the film. His name's Mike White. Oh, I know that name. He's written a ton of stuff. His his um, uh, career is all over the place. It's not oh, he's really... done like big studio comedies, and he's done like weird independent movies. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then some, but uh, another character, t uh, I think. But basically, it's it's very. It feels like a movie that was based on a book, because it's very inner monologue-y. Mm -hmm. And um, Ben Stiller's like he's like flipping through all their Facebook pictures, and people are like enjoying their, their lives. They have private planes, and he's like he's he runs a nonprofit. He's like a schlub. He's very shallow and and pathetic, and he he's evaluating his life at that point okay. while his son is is starting his life off. So it's it's really a coming of old age story. The son is a pianist, and so he meets up with his friends, college friends. Um, or soon to be college friends. And they're all like, they're like, well, we're do, we do the social justice thing. And he's like, he's like, shit, I remember when I was youthful and I cared about the world. <laughs> and the girl's like, what, you, you run a nonprofit? That's so great, you know, what do you wanna do? And he's like, he's like, just, you know what? Here's my advice to you. Just make a whole bunch of money. <laughs> and, then, and then she basically tells him that you are, you are not starving in a third world country. You have so much white privilege. You are misguided mm. in, in your life's goals. You are pathetic. <laughs> and, and so there's a nice little twist there and, and it feels cliche. It feels like it would be, but it was fairly engaging. And I think it was the way he was talking because he was like running these monologues about how he, he kind of like secretly hoped his son wouldn't be successful because then he would be like jealous of his own son and, and kind of like the, the weird thoughts people have about life mm. in general. And, and it worked, it was cute. And it was pretty smartly written and enjoyable. And, and I actually like Ben Stiller in it. Oh. Uh, it's not a movie that I would recommend to anyone though. <laughs> Dad, you having some kind of nervous breakdown or something? Under pressure. Speaking of, of someone flipping through uh, Facebook and looking at po pictures of people's lives and how happy and every as successful everyone else is and how miserable they are, let's talk about our next film, Jay, Star Wars The Last Jedi. Oh no, that's just real life where people flip through social media and just yell at each other about their opinions on Star Wars endlessly, all day, every day. Let me rewrite The Last Jedi. Here's my script. Well, that's how movies should be made. They, you say to the audience, Disney can say, hey, what do you want to see? And then someone submits their idea and then they make it and then 500 million other people say that that's wrong, so then they have to make it again. So I think from now on, Disney's just going to be remaking The Last Jedi for every individual who wants you know, to see specific things in it. It's called crowd screenwriting. Mm. And then everybody has their own version of The Last Jedi and everyone's happy, but no one's happy. I kid. I am, of course, I'm talking about Ingrid Goes West. Oh, was I supposed to say it? Yeah. Congratulations. Thanks for inviting me, you fucking cunt! This is a film starring Aubrey Plaza. Uh, the first time I've seen her in a movie where she was actually used appropriately. I wanted to say that! <laughs> Because what were those movies? She did the Mike and Dave Need Wedding Dates, which was awful. And then she did uh, the Dirty Grandpa movie, which was awful. I didn't see that. And in both cases, because like she was perfectly cast on Parks and Rec as April Ludgate. I wanted to make fun of stupid people while I get drunk. My two true passions. Like that's, that's, She's perfect for that character. I want to say there's a story behind that where where she wasn't supposed to be on the show and like Amy Poehler, like, she was like an intern helping with like the casting process and she was just like this miserable. That was just her personality. Yeah, and, and Amy Poehler or some producer was like, you're just like, like a miserable, awful person. <laughs> you should play a character on the show. Okay, well that makes and sense. I, and I think that's how she got into acting. 
Well, that I want. I, I, I don't know if she did comedy. Like I oh, think she's a comedian too. But, okay. But that would make sense because because yeah. she's absolutely perfect for that part. Yeah. But then she's in these stupid like like boner comedies, and she's playing like like the sexy slutty girl, and it's like that's not her at all. You know, which isn't a comment on her physical appearance, but just like her general like personality, or, right. or it doesn't match that yeah. that type of character. She's very sardonic, yeah, and, and miserable, and and she it's 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 her face too. She has that like she has she has a little RBF, um, and yeah. her playing an obsessive crazy person is perfect. Yes, she she's fantastic in this movie. I I don't know how you feel. I liked this movie a lot. What I said was it's the the scariest movie I've seen all year, and it's not even a horror film. It's true. Uh, this is the first movie I've seen that really tackles because because it's about she kind of gets obsessed with uh, someone who's famous on Instagram, One of which the Olsen is girls. it's uh, Elizabeth Olsen, yeah. um, Scarlet Witch in the Avengers movies. Right. We have to mention the Avengers. We have to mention something comic book related so people watch the video. Check out our Avengers recap, also with other films mentioned. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, and, and it's the first movie I've seen that really captures the kind of psychology of like a parasocial relationship, which is that one-sided relationship where you you follow someone on Instagram or Twitter or whatever, and you feel like they're your friend, even though they don't know you fucking exist. Without, um, it's a scary, scary world uh, yeah. when it comes to that stuff. And without making it uh, goofy. Yes. Well, it, it could be, uh, as a movie we'll talk about later on our, our, our lists, uh, Wish Upon, there's a way to do a movie that where it's it's clearly written by like an older person that's trying to like act like they understand yes. younger people or younger trends. Uh, this movie feels very uh, believable and of its time in the way it deals with those aspects of of social media. Yeah, I mean the, I mean Aubrey Plaza. She's following um, Elizabeth Olsen's Instagram. Her character's name is Taylor something. I can't yeah. remember, but. Um, and those those like fast cutting montages of the Instagram world yeah. are just like perfectly done. Mm -hmm. Like beautiful day today, you know, eating this thing, hashtag like life is great. And it's like <laughs> it's like And it would be very easy to make the Elizabeth Olsen character really one dimensional and shallow. Yes. Uh, and and both her and Aubrey Plaza, they they flesh them out and make them believable mm -hmm. people. And mm -hmm. you kind of understand even though the situation is terrifying and horrible, you understand both of their kind of mentalities. Yeah, yeah. You could make Elizabeth Olsen, when she finally meets up with her, she's not just like, like, oh, I'm a perfect person on, on Instagram or whatever, and in real life, I'm just like this miserable bitch. Yeah. You know, she's like very friendly towards her, and, and everything's normal, and she's not a horrible person. They become friends, and, you know, you, you get a little bit of the phoniness, but it's not... It's not done to like a very two-dimensional level. It's very realistic feeling. Yeah, it almost feels mumblecore-ish a little. Yeah, a little bit. Um, but my only flaw is that her brother was a little cartoony, and he probably would have called the police after <laughs> someone kidnapped him in a van. Oh yeah, and, yeah. And beat him. That's true. That goes a little too extreme. There but I but I did really like a uh, special shout out to Aubrey Plaza's landlord yes. slash boyfriend. Look at my shit. It was an accident, okay? Is there anything else I need to know about Ingrid? We might have done all of your cocaine that we found in there. Thank you, guys. Thank you for your service. But he's played by uh, Ice Cube's son, and he also played Ice Cube in the Straight Outta Compton movie, um, which he was fine in that. But in this movie, I was like, this guy's, this guy's got something. Like, he's very charismatic, and it's a very unconventional character, too. Right. Um, he's, that's another character that could be kind of a one-dimensional uh, character, but it, like he has this like obsession with Batman, yeah. and he's just really like charming. Like I would like to see a movie starring him. You could play off the of stereotypes of all three of these characters mm -hmm. and make them one-dimensional. Like, you know, the, he's he's like smoking the not pot, but he's smoking the what do they call those e-cigarettes or sure. vapes? He's vaping. He's vaping, and he's like, he's like, yeah, it's 420 friendly here, you know, but no pets, and you know, you could. Be, but then, like you say, is that added layer of he wants to be a screenwriter, he loves Batman. Um, <laughs> uh, she's supposed to come back to read for Catwoman in a, in a table read, and she doesn't. She crashes his truck, and he's there's, a very, mad, there's but, a very odd sex scene with her dressed up as Catwoman. Yes. And, yes. <laughs> um, but so yeah, there, there's. It's not like full on like like taxi driver serious when it comes to dealing with with the mentally 
insane person. <laughs> but uh, and so there's little moments of levity and the little kind of like sitcom-y kind of elements in there. But the overall picture is more realistic. And and the like you said the the relationship between follower and Instagrammer and the, the and psychology of the how perceived. that can affect you like on both sides like on Elizabeth Olsen like you know there's like a pressure to kind of keep posting photos and, and keeping up this facade and then on the Aru Plaza side of yeah just wanting to achieve what is essentially fake yeah and then there's there's a moment when she said like. I know something's wrong with me, but I don't know what to do about it. Where it was like this little nice moment where you kind of realize that she isn't just like crazy. Ha ha, look at how crazy she is. She's yeah. stalking someone. Isn't that funny? And, it, and it's, it's really entertaining and it doesn't go the way you expect. And then at the end, um, the end is when it hits you with the message real strong. Everybody get Mike, can I take a moment to talk about some apes? Talk about them apes and that planet that's full of them. We are not savages. Apes fight only to survive. No, you saw the the first two Planet of the Apes movies in this Jerry. trilogy, and you liked them. I remember that James Franco had an ape in his attic. <laughs> and then James Franco said he didn't want to be in the movies anymore, and the next one, they were in the woods. And that's all I remember. There was a character named Caesar. Yes. Like Julius well, that's, Caesar. Well, Caesar is the focus of this entire trilogy. And this, this is the conclusion to his arc. And it's a fan, fantastic movie. Uh, I liked the previous two. I think they've gotten increasingly better. And this one, I'm going to say I liked it so much, it's up there with some of my favorites of the year. I'm sorry to be disrespectful. Let me show you how much I care with my body language. Okay. Well, the problem with this series of movies is that the titles for every single one of them is fucking wrong. Dawn of the Planet of the Apes should have been called Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Rise of the Planet of the Apes should have been called Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. And then this movie's called War of the Planet of the Apes, and there's no war. Uh, this is not a war movie. It's not an action movie. It's actually really, uh, really, like, somber and really, uh, it's more of like a little prison break movie than anything. And these monkeys, they got to break these monkeys free. And it's goddamn fantastic. It, it has this tone that a lot of big movies don't have, which is that it's a big kind of spectacular premise, but it takes itself seriously enough. And it doesn't feel stupid. It's clever. And it's well made. And, and we're lacking that. Like these big spectacle movies where the effects are kind of the focus, which, I mean, this entire movie, it's a bunch of CG apes, and you believe it every step of the way. I like I like Caesar as a character. It's crazy. He's completely, you know, it's Andy Circus. He's completely uh, CG, yeah, yeah. and he's just such a like compelling, interesting character. And I remember all that being very good. The, it's, the it's, subtlety, yeah, and, and, and that's that's amped up more in this. Like yeah. that's the main focus of the movie, and just the idea, the themes of like, at this point, this this kind of war between humans and apes has been going on so long that the people that kind of started it aren't even around anymore. They're all dead, but we still are fighting each other. Sure. And, you know, the, the themes of that and how that kind of reflects in our world. It's, it's, it's a wonderful movie. Yeah, I'm sure there's lots of, uh, sort of allegorical stuff. I'm sure there's lots of really great performances and writing and depthful characters and action and all the things you want from a movie, but I just don't care. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the first two films I remember liking them. Um, and, and I'm sure people will comment, you, you don't want to watch that, but you watched Jurassic World and you liked that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. May, I, maybe I find dinosaurs a little more interesting. It's, it's weird that personal taste is like a thing that exists. It's, it, yeah. is, it is. It um, is. However, can I just comment on the upcoming year, the trailer for the next Jurassic World movie. Oh my God. Movie. Run! Uh, I thought the trailer was a joke. <laughs> um, how I've never looked at my watch during a trailer. <laughs> and I, it was like, we got to go back to the island. Again. There are, those are dinosaurs there. Again. What do we do? Do we just let them die out? Or do we go and fuck around with them again? Because a whole shitload of people got killed before. <laughs> for no reason. Let's all go. And then it, and then it's just like scenes of like just random dinosaurs running around. Yeah. And like lava flying in the air. And I'm like, now this looks bad. 
Speaking of checking your watch during a trailer, have you seen the trailer for Slender Man? I have not. I watched the first minute of it and I was like, I'm done. Is it a Blumhouse it's, it's only film? A, I don't think it is. No, it's a Sony movie. It's, yeah. like, it's, it's like a two minute trailer and I couldn't even sit through it. It's like, ah, I've had enough. <laughs> What's our next film? A lot of my films that I'd like to talk about are scary films. Well, let's talk about a scary film. I guess one film that wasn't really very scary, it was more disturbing, was called The Belko Experiment. Your chance of survival increases by following my orders. Your task is simply this. Kill three of your co-workers, or we will kill six others. Hey, all the lines are dead. I like movies where people are trapped in a, a, in a hopeless situation and have to figure a way out. And I like movies where people's heads explode. Yes, uh, violence that's so, <laughs> so uh, extreme and disturbing that you want to throw up. Well, I predicted this movie before I saw it. I saw the trailer. It's written by James Gunn, who I, I am a big fan was of. Was it really? Yes. Oh yeah, it was an old script of his, right? It, it was like a script that he had lying around that he it didn't get made for years, but now he has some clout. So they're like, what else do you got, James Gunn? Uh, so it was a script written by him and it's directed by an Australian guy. I can't remember his name, but he directed the Wolf Creek movies, which are like torture pornish type, just lots of people being hacked apart type movies without any sort of wit or intelligence. And so I saw the trailer for Belko Experiment I saw those two names and I was like, this is gonna be a tonal mess. This is gonna be, uh, like I can picture what it would be if James Gunn directed it, because he is, is pretty adept at shifting between tones in a way that actually works. And I was like, oh, but it's being directed by a guy who's tone deaf. And so that's kind of what it was. It's an all right movie. I mean, I like the, I like the idea, the, the premise was creepy and just sort of like the whole uh, uh, way that everyone just turns on each other. I like movies like that. Yeah. Um, kind of a weird ending. I don't know. I thought it was good. It was it was different. Uh, there's actually another movie that came out this last year with like the exact same premise. Not exact same premise, but similar, which is called Mayhem. Oh, I thought you were talking about Star Wars The Last Jedi. What the hell is going on? Say hello to the ID7 virus. Mayhem is another movie about uh, people in an office building going crazy and murdering each other. But unlike the Belko experiment, it really embraces the absurdity of it. And it's a lot more uh, comedic as a result of it, just like because everybody's losing their minds. Uh, and it's directed with a lot more kind of energy to it and a more of a, a knowing sense of humor. Yeah. Which I'm assuming that James Gunn's script for Belko experiment had and that kind of got lost in translation with a different director. Um, See, I, I think I wouldn't, I liked the Belko experiment because it, it remained grounded. And, and I think, I've never seen the Saw movies and, I, and generally the torture porn movies don't appeal to me. I just yeah. don't like it. I like more of when characters have to make rational choices to escape a, 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 a conflict or a, a problem. You know what I mean? Like, there's the part, and there's many parts, but there, there's the idea that the, the voice that comes through the speakers is gonna execute 20 people unless you kill 10 yourselves, or whatever the whatever happened. Yeah, they, they so, give you a, a moral dilemma. Moral dilemma, and then, they, and then, you know, the one guy's like, okay, well, round up. Uh, who's older than 55, yeah, you know? But I've got them. kids! Yeah. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, that, then and it's like almost becomes that, that really dark, it goes to the dark psychological place of the brain. Yeah. And I, 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 I like that in, I don't like the gore, I don't like the torture, but I like when you have to go to that, that dark place in your brain and when people are forced to, everyday people. So I think that's what I liked about the movie. Two, one. A lot of the gore and stuff started to make me sick. <laughs> well, that's where I think the James Gunn touch would have helped because the gore probably would have been handled in a way where you're almost laughing at it a bit more. Yeah. Um, as opposed to we have this this dark psychological concept and we're gonna you know round up these people and kill them and it's just like so intense and it never has that release in the way that I think it maybe would have in the hands of a different filmmaker. Yeah. So it makes the gore feel even more kind of sickening. Right. Uh, which, I mean, you know, there are people that are into that too, but to me, I think the movie definitely needed a, a, 
a, a lighter touch in certain aspects of it. Not the psychological stuff, but more the visceral stuff. You either, you either go full on, full on like psychological horror with no jokes. That's, that's why the James Gunn jokes sort of threw me out of it. Sure. I was like, take this subject matter very seriously or make, you know, dead alive. Yeah. You know what I mean? May Mayhem falls closer to the dead alive territory yeah. and, it, and it works in that respect. I, I think I like Mayhem more than Belko Experiment. I like them both to a certain extent, but Mayhem, yeah. I think just for my kind of personal taste, the, the fact that it embraces the absurdity kind of appealed to me more. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about a film starring Anne Hathaway that's not terrible. <laughs> Colossal. You all right? Yeah, uh, it's this nervous tick I have. I get this itch. Oh my God. Uh, Colossal was a surprise to me. I really, really liked it. Um, the most surprising thing about it was how much I liked Jason Sudeikis in it. Cause he's like Saturday Night Live guy and he's the most boring person ever. Uh, but I, he really left an impression in this movie. Once he, you know, his character has kind of a turn at a certain point and it's really convincing and he's really, really great. And I've heard some people complain about after that turn that it, it feels almost out of character or out of place or it comes out of nowhere. But if you go back and rewatch the movie, it's there all along. He's playing the, the like phony nice, the nice guy. And I think he does it really great, really convincing. Yeah. Um, the biggest problem for me with Colossal is that the entire time I was watching it, I was thinking how much better the lead character would have been if it was played not by Anne Hathaway, but by Gillian Jacobs. Yeah, well, I thought the film worked without the premise of I'm controlling a giant monster. <laughs> but I mean, that's the hook. And, and that's, I think that's why it's on the list this year of movies to talk about, because the premise is just so so darn odd. It, it's very odd, uh, and I liked. I, I almost wish that they didn't explain it. That would require tons of rewrites because uh, it felt obviously a little hokey. It's yeah. They, there's the flashback to explain why she suddenly is now in control of a giant kaiju monster across the world. Because of her emotional response to him throwing her toy into the river. A beam of light from space yeah. gave her the power. It, so, it, it ties in with the. Uh, <laughs> The, the character stuff between her and Jason Sudeikis. So I get that. There's, sure. cer there's certain things in movies where you kind of need some backstory, need some explanation, but this, I think it actually would have worked better. It was just just complete metaphor and it was never explained. It's like, that that felt like someone, eh, you gotta put that in there because you have this movie with these two bigger stars yeah. and you can't just have weird shit like that. It has to have <laughs> some kind of, but yeah, it, it it's obviously, metaphorical yeah. uh, hit you over the head kind of metaphorical with, with the but but you're right or not your but people are right about the Jason Sudeikis character and gen generally the shifts because it, it starts off and has this kind of like wacky fun tone to it and then it goes to dark places rather quickly um, and and it was just so bizarre but it was entertaining yeah well there's a scene with Jason Sudeikis when he uh the, this, the scene Firework where he's pulling scene? out the fireworks, yeah. where I was just like riveted. Yeah. I was like, oh, this is this generic Saturday Night Live guy that I've never given a shit about. And he is captivating in this scene. Mm -hmm. So I, I even without the, the kind of goofy kaiju monster stuff, like I think it's worth seeing just for him. Oh yeah, um, yeah. But I did like all that stuff too. I, I liked the, uh, the slow realization that she's in control of this giant monster. I like the design of the monster. It's a little silly. Mm -hmm. um, and her kind of watching on TV and realizing what's going on. So just the entire the entire setup is so unique yeah. that, that it keeps you engaged. It's, it's the discovery phase of of what's happening. Yeah. Like, the, you know, like everyone's like, yeah, you see that monster attack on TV last night. What? It, what? Once oh that's God, in God. place, it gets a little less interesting. It's kind of like the, the superhero origin story problem, yes. where yeah. it's like the first half of the movie is them discovering their... Yeah their superpowers and then, oh, and then we got to fight an evil bad guy. It kind of falls into that a little right. bit. It's a hard one. It's a hard one to completely get behind or nail down because it could go in so many different directions. The direction that they chose worked for the most part. Um, although it, it made you a little uncomfortable and, and took you out of it how 
basically fucked up and disturbing and misogynistic and evil Jason Sudeikis' character was. Like, yeah. he, he turned into a real monster. It's a movie I could see a lot of people just going, that sucked. Because it, you can't put it in a box. You can't put it in a box. <laughs> it, it cannot be contained in, into a nice, neat package. Yeah. Which is like, how do you market this movie? Like, where, where did this come from? Like, what do you, yeah, it's a romantic Not, comedy. Yeah. It's a monster movie. It's a, it's a movie about abuse. It's, it's a movie about, about alcohol abuse and, and, and... Well, and emotional abuse. Emotional abuse about... And that, I think that's why I liked it so much, is that it's, it's nice to see something that mm -hmm. you can't easily categorize. Yeah, you know, it's a movie like that, Star Wars The Last Jedi. <laughs> it's, it, it, that, I mean, that was a very hard to market film. Oh, it's yes. like, how do you get people in the theater to watch a film basically they don't really know anything about? Yeah. They've got their work cut out for them. But speaking of highly recommended movies, now we can talk about a film we've both seen together uh, that we both will highly recommend. And it's called Wish Upon. <laughs> the funniest movie of 2017. Uh, I cannot say enough, enough great things about Wish Upon. I wish Darcy Chapman would just go rot. Uh, it, it, it is up there to me. It's up there with The Room, um, the Troll 2. It's, it's up there with some of the best <laughs> I don't think movies. I would rank it that high, but it is really funny. And this is a case of, like we were talking about with Ingrid Goes West, um, and how accurately that depicts kind of social media and younger people and the way they interact with social media. This is a movie that's written by a fucking 50-year-old dude trying to write teenagers. The, the, the main girl is, is, she has like a fascination with multiverses. And so her love interest is like, yo, bro, you're into multiverses too? And it's just like the dumbest shit. Okay, Jay, you're getting real specific right off the bat. Uh, uh, I'm sure you've seen the trailer for this. It, it's, it's, it's the Wishmaster without the Wishmaster. Right. It's just a box. Girl, girl finds magic wish box, or rather her father, played by Ryan Philippi, he finds it in a dumpster, and that's where they found Ryan Phillippe to be in the movie. Yes. Where the fuck's he been? Uh, uh, there's so many wonderful things. And, and Jay, that's why I put this up there with, with some of the, the best B-movies of all time, because there are so many bad things. You could say, like, you know, some of those the horror, horror movies we watch that are bad. You just yeah. say, oh, they're bad. This, there's, it's so nuanced. There's lots which, of specific odd things. There's lots of specific odd things that, that I can't even get into all of them now. Right. Her dad is a garbage picker. Yes. That's his job. I mean, it starts off with her mom killing herself. She, she throws the wish box in the trash. The girl, in the beginning of the film, the girl's riding on her bike and it's a happy, lovely day. She even has a puppy. <laughs> and it's sunshine and, 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 and beautiful golden light and there's a puppy riding with her and you're like, oh no, the girl's gonna die. She's gonna get hit by a car. And then the mom dies by killing herself because the, the wish box told her to or something. And then the girl throws her bike in the front lawn and runs upstairs. Cut to 10 years later, we do a dissolve. The bike is still in the exact same spot. <laughs> 10 years later. <laughs> to let you know it's the same house. <laughs> I mean, I, th I think Mr. Plinkett needs to go through this movie. Oh my God. Uh, it's that bad. And it's that fascinating. And how incompetent and, and horribly executed and, and ill-advised and, <laughs> and ev every, every descriptive word you could possibly think of. Um, she, she has the wish box and th the, the plotting is so nonsensical. <laughs> And then she, she's like, I've got this Chinese wish box. Let me go seek out my Chinese friend who says, I don't know about ancient Chinese, but my cool hip Chinese sister who lives in a warehouse with like hipster stuff all over knows about Chinese. The sister falls on like, like the horn of a goat statue. <laughs> and, and oh yeah, there's, there's like Final Destination-esque uh, death set pieces. Uh, there's the one with Cheryl and Fenn from Twin Peaks, who shows up in this movie. She has extremely long hair. 
Uh, it's like a be careful what you wish for kind of thing. She, she wants. Well, the, yeah, the whole premise is she can make a wish. It's like a monkey's paw thing. Like yeah. you make a wish, but then someone you know will die, right? Isn't that the idea? And, and often it's a character that's unrelated. Yeah. Um, yeah, it has nothing to do with anything. It's just somebody that you know. Somebody that the movie knows <laughs> will die. Let's just put it that way. Um, her rich uncle slips in the bathtub and hits his head, and then they inherit his fortune. <laughs> Um, but even though they've inherited his fortune and have a mansion, Ryan Phillippe uh, still cannot resist the urge to garbage pick. <laughs> Dad, I thought you would stop garbage picking. I just can't help myself. We're fucking millionaires. I found these great curtain rods. Um, and then... Doesn't he want to be a musician too? He used to be a musician. <laughs> and then... Uh, she's so embarrassed that her dad is picking through dumpsters right outside of her high school <laughs> that she uses the wish box to wish that her dad was cool. Cut to Ryan Phillippe, like in dad jeans, playing a saxophone. <laughs> and her, her and her friends are like, ooh. You know, yeah. what a dream boat. He's so cool. And, and he's. Uh, does I he guess, have, when he's a garbage picker, does he have like a comically fake beard? Yes, he has yeah. a bad glue on beard. So then he doesn't have the. They, they peeled off the fake they peeled beard. Off, yeah. And suddenly, like, jazz musicians are his friends. <laughs> um, this movie is so bad that it's good. <laughs> um, it was directed by, I think, a guy who's mostly known for being a DP. Yes. Uh, he, he's done like all the James Wan movies and, and he directed and, the first Annabelle, I think. Yeah, he's like an elderly man. Yeah. And so, and you have a girl who's like 16 in the lead, and all of her <laughs> friends, and oh, and and the screenwriter is an elderly black woman. Okay. Because I looked up who wrote it. I'm like, who wrote this? Because there was <laughs> there, the there are lines that sound like Tommy Wiseau wrote them, and I'm yeah. like, from, coming from teenage kids, and it's some old lady. <laughs> And, and so, uh, I'm not elderly shaming here, but you have people that are making this movie that, that don't seem to be quite connected yeah. with, with, with the youth. And I remember we were watching it, and it's like every five minutes there's a what yeah. moment. What? Why is yeah. this happening? Yeah, and, and there's like, there's one of the girl characters has sort of like like a Pokemon cat oh, game. Oh yeah! And and she's like, I amidst gotta... all this terror that's going on, she's like, they're at like a hotel. Yes. She's like, I know, I know, there's some rough shit going on, but I gotta go upstairs and catch yeah. this. I monster. gotta go up to the top floor of this hotel with with the open atrium and glass <laughs> elevator, and I'm gonna play this. It's it's not a Pokemon, but it's like a monster game, yeah, like a it's, witch it's, or it's something. It's Pokemon Go, basically. Yeah, it's the version of that, but it's like okay. Eh, this like this like Asian girl in high school isn't gonna do the Pokemon Go thing. Like it doesn't make sense. Yeah, you know? it the, all the all the characters' actions and all their lines are so bizarre, <laughs> and that it's amazing. Uh, one of my favorites of the year. <laughs> so everyone, go out tonight. Rent the movie tonight. I, I want to see a news story on, on CNN.com. <laughs> Digital sales for Wish Upon went from three to three million <laughs> overnight. <laughs> Nobody can explain it. I wish. Well, Jay, we certainly have a lot of movies to recap in 2017, and we've been talking for a very long time. Why don't we split it into two videos? We'll see you next time. Fuck you! <laughs>